and welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Dave Rosenstein. I'm a member of Community Board 8 and your host for tonight's show. Uh, Community Board 8 Speaks is a monthly program about issues of interest to residents and businesses in the Community Board 8 area. Um, the board area extends from 59th Street North to 59th Street from Fifth Avenue to the East River and includes Roosevelt Island. Uh, community boards have 50 unsalaried members appointed by the borough president in consultation with local city council members, one of whom is our guest tonight. Uh, board members play an advisory role in zoning and land use issues and community planning and the city budget process and in the coordination of municipal services. You can learn more about CB8 at our website, which is www.cb, as in community board, the number 8, m.com. Which should be on the uh, on the screen for you. Our guest tonight is Jessica Lappin, City Council Member for Council District Five. District Five covers essentially the east side of the east side, from 49th Street to 92nd Street, as well as all of the two-mile-long Roosevelt Island and its 10,000 plus residents. We may have a district map available on the screen. Uh, Jessica Lappin is a lifelong. New Yorker and a graduate of Stuyvesant High School. She earned her BA in government from George Washington University, Georgetown University, and where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa and Magna Cum Laude. Well, she joined New York City Council staff in 1998 and served until 2005 as a senior advisor and district chief of staff to former council speaker Gifford Miller. She has served on the city council herself since January 2006 and was re-elected in November to a second four-year term. Ms. Lappin serves on the Council's Land Use Committee and chairs its Subcommittee on Landmarks, Public Siting, and Maritime Uses. She's also a member of the Council's Committees on Education, Transportation, General Welfare, and Standards and Ethics. Jessica, welcome to CB8 Speaks. And first, congratulations on your re-election uh, to a second term. Thank uh, you for having me, and it's, it's an honor to be able to serve for four more years. I'm very grateful. Thank you. As full disclosure, I supported you in your first campaign, and, uh, and again, this year, in spite of the flu, I did make some calls to <laughs> Roosevelt Island, and uh, uh, they love you out there. <laughs> it, was, it was quite very easy calls to make. Um, let's talk about where we're going. What are your priorities for the, uh, the coming term? Well, I want to continue to work on some of the issues that have been important to me and to the neighborhood, uh, building more schools, particularly on the east side, finding ways to improve our environment, improving our transportation system. Those are probably the three big areas that I have worked on and want to continue to work on. I do think we're going to have some additional challenges ahead in the next few years, the economy being the most obvious one. We have a budget deficit we're going to have to grapple with, and it's important to me that we find a way, even in tough times, to protect core services and to keep this city livable and to maintain a quality of life, keep crime in check, uh, and make sure that it's a place that people still want to live uh, and raise their mm -hmm. families. So we're going to have an interesting few years ahead of us. I have to ask you about term limits. That was such a controversial issue in the last election. What does that how does that affect the, the city council members? Well, the mayor had put in a bill to extend the terms from two to three, and I voted against it. Even though I philosophically opposed term limits, I didn't think it was the right way to do it. Um, but it did pass, so there are some members who were able to run for re-election. It wouldn't have impacted me, because as you mentioned, I was just in my first term. Um, so there was some turnover, both people who left voluntarily. There were five incumbents who lost. They did happen to be people who had voted in favor of the term limit extension. Um, although I don't think that's why they lost. I think if you look at each individual race, mm -hmm. there were different factors that played a role um, in their respective communities as to why they weren't successful. Um, but it'll be interesting to see the new council. We do have a dozen or so new members coming in, which is about 10% of the body. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be interesting to see how that changes things. Hopefully some people with some more energy and great ideas and can bring us a, a fresh perspective because that's, that's always a helpful thing. Let's talk about some of the issues that uh, uh, come up time and time again in, in the community board uh, in the categories of education, environment, and transportation. Let's take education first. Sure. Um, we've got two general issues, the lower, lower schools and the issue of the Julia Richmond Hunter College 
complex and what's going to happen with that. Uh, you were involved in, in finding a home, at least temporarily, for PS 151. So give us an overview. Sure. Of what, uh, so this year we had wait lists for the very first time on the east side of Manhattan for locally zoned mm -hmm. schools. Our schools are overcrowded and bursting at the seams. Mm -hmm. um, PS 151 had been in the neighborhood, was closed down roughly a decade or so, just a little bit less and is the site of the new Eastside Middle School that's under construction and actually almost completed, should be opening in a few months. So we really worked with the parents and educators in the neighborhood to push the Department of Education after all this time to open a PS 151. There were families who were in a zone that didn't exist. Uh, so we did have a new PS 151 open this fall in what is a temporary leased space, an old uh, archdiocese school on 91st Street. And that school will grow uh, each year and will help relieve the overcrowding in the neighborhood. The new Eastside Middle School I just mentioned is going to open in a few months after the, during the winter break. So that's going to be larger and help relieve some of the middle school crunch. And also they're moving out of the elementary school on York Avenue, PS 158. So that's going to give us some additional room in that building that we can use next fall as well. But in terms of Julia Richmond, that was a proposal to have the Julia Richmond schools moved to another location and have Hunter build a building mm -hmm. on that site for CUNY. My understanding, at least at this point, is that that deal has succumb to the real estate market and the downturn in the economy. Really? Uh, I haven't heard any news other than they issued a request for proposals for the site uh, over a year ago and nothing has really happened since then. So uh, I would doubt that even the people who responded then right before the whole market fell off a cliff would still be interested or have the financing, but there doesn't appear to be anything happening on that project. I was always disappointed that nobody proposed putting the Hunter College Science Tower on top of the existing building so that we wouldn't have to have one or the other. But um, I think there was some discussion of having a new elementary school for the neighborhood in a building, um, but the community was still... But it would have meant several years of, of, of a gap. Right. Uh, let's go to transportation, because this is at last week's community board meeting, bicycles and bicycle safety were very hot issues at the monthly uh, 19th Precinct Community Council. It's the number one issue. Um, you just proposed legislation which sounds like it's got a pretty good chance of passage. I hope so. It's, it's an issue that I hear about all the time and have heard about consistently for years. It's a real public safety issue. I hear from seniors. Mm -hmm. I hear from children. I know you were hit by a bike yourself. I was. So it's a, it's a very serious public safety issue. My bill would transfer some of the liability for people who are illegally riding their bikes to the owners of the restaurants or the businesses who employ them. I think until we can get those owners on the hook financially, they're not going to care enough to really instruct uh, their riders about the rules of the road. So we had a hearing at City Hall, which was very well attended and very productive about a month ago. Um, and I'm hoping that as we transition into the new council, we'll be able to move it forward. When I was hit, the police took down the information on the, um, uh, the deliverer, but not who he was working for. So they need to add that to their police Absolutely. reports. Absolutely. I mean, often these are immigrants who may or may not speak English, who may or may not know the rules of the road. Um, and the onus, I think, is on their employer to train them. Um, if they're going to put them out on those streets, make sure that they're safe and that they know what they're supposed to be doing. So I think it's in everybody's best interest. Now, on the other transportation issues, Second Avenue subway, the impact it's having on the community now, on the 86th Street area, on the 72nd Street area, um, impact on traffic, on businesses, what, what, what can you... It's been really, really tough. Do? It's been really tough, particularly on the businesses. The residents are feeling the impacts too, but the businesses are feeling it in their pocketbooks, and that's, that's really tough. So we have been trying to work one-on-one -on -one if need be. I helped one restaurant get a license for a sidewalk cafe, helped other restaurants deal with city agencies. So to whatever extent we can help people one-on-one, -on -one, um, but on a larger scale, trying to push the MTA to come up with a marketing campaign for them, making sure that there is communication, because if you don't know that Con Ed's going to cut your power, 
and you don't turn your compressors off, then that can mean you blow them out. And all it takes is somebody calling you to say, here's what's going to happen, here's how you prepare. You know, we had a jewelry store last year around the holidays who couldn't do credit card transactions. Obviously, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it could be avoided by communication. I hope that we have learned somewhat from what's happened in the 90s so that as this project does move south, we can at least try to avoid some of the mistakes of the past. How about transportation along 2nd Avenue? We have, we have this proposal for uh, bus rapid transit. We also have a present need for the Department of Transportation and the police to make sure that the traffic keeps flowing mm -hmm. through these constricted areas. Well, I'm a big believer in bus rapid transit, which is basically just better, faster, improved bus service along 1st and 2nd Avenues. That is the most heavily utilized bus route in North America. Really? It is. So we have to find a way to make it work better for people. And there was just a story in the Daily News yesterday, the MTA announcing that they're planning to launch in September 2010 this improved bus route along 1st and 2nd Avenues, where you would have the ability to prepay before you boarded so that you wouldn't have people waiting in line to swipe their metro cards. You would have a reconfiguration of the sub the sidewalks there so that the buses didn't have to weave in and out. The sidewalk would meet the buses. Uh, they would have technology to change the lights so that if a bus was coming, it wouldn't be stopped potentially at a red light. Um, so some what we hope will be pretty dramatic improvements. And I'm very excited about it. It's something all of the elected officials on the east side have been advocating for uh, for quite some time, and I think that's why we're getting it. They have been, they've had a pilot program in the Bronx, but because we all said with one voice, this is something we'd like in our community, I, we're going to get it. I almost overlooked the uh, trams upcoming shutdown. This is going to have a huge impact on Roosevelt Island. It, it is. It, we've had a problem with transportation to and from Roosevelt Island before this. Mm -hmm. This is only going to exacerbate the problem. It's going to go down in March um, for six to nine months for a total overhaul, which will be great when it's completed, but in the interim it's going to make it very tough for people to get on and off the island. So uh, I've been working with the city at a meeting yesterday with uh, EDC and DOT about temporary ferry service to the island during the outage. We've been talking to the MTA about bus and train service or getting the state, uh, or in addition getting the state, to run buses into Manhattan themselves. So we're going to try to find ways to make it better for people. Um, but it's an island. They're isolated. It's difficult as it is, and this is only going to make it worse. Is there any chance of getting the regular city MTA buses to pick passengers up on Roosevelt Island and take them to Queensboro Plaza? Well, there are. there is an MTA route that stops on the island. Uh, and we have experimented with doing different things at different points because the tram's been down at other times mm -hmm. for either maintenance or repair. Uh, and we've had mm, some success, some failures, but we have tried different things at different points. Because of the two hospitals on the island, there is already a bus stop near one of them for the nurses and doctors who commute to the hospitals. Because I know people come to the community board and they say that uh, in rush hour they can let two or three trains go by because they just mm -hmm. can't get on. That's right. They're already filled. Uh, in the environmental area, um, the New York Times recently had an editorial, I think it was on Election Day, on this hydraulic uh, fracturing, which is apparently very dangerous for the water supply. Mm -hmm. You've been speaking actively on this, as has uh, our borough president, Scott Stringer. Well, you know, Scott and I had a town hall meeting together where mm -hmm. half a dozen or so people came and spoke out on this issue. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting. It's why I have town hall meetings. It wasn't something that either of us knew a lot about. And we realized this is an important issue. So, uh, you know, hydrofracking, what it is, is it's a method of harvesting natural gas where you shoot chemicals into the ground. The problem is we don't know what the chemicals are and we do know that they're harmful, both to the environment and to people's health. And our 90% of our water supply sits on top of natural gas reserves. So that's why it's a real danger for our drinking water. Um, I sponsored a resolution in the city council with the chair of the Environmental Protection Committee that passed last week, urging the state to ban this practice. Testified last week at a hearing that the state was holding on rules. Uh, we would have liked the governor to say no banning at all. Uh, unfortunately, they are now in the process of saying we may allow it in some places, in some instances, and we're going to formulate the rules to explain to people how it would be done. I think it's very dangerous, and I don't think we should be gambling with our drinking water. I assume the uh 
our Congresswoman Carolyn Maloney has also been looking She is, and I'm glad you mentioned that. There is a federal bill, uh, it's called the FRAC Act, and it has been introduced in both the House and the Senate, and it would ban hydraulic fracturing, this method, um, in general, um, there was what we call sort of the Halliburton exemption. That's because, what the Times called yes, it. Yes, the Hallibur Halliburton is one of the companies that does this, mm -hmm. um, and that was sort of when there was the last piece of legislation that dealt with our drinking water, they were given this exemption. Um, so there is federal legislation, and Congresswoman Maloney is on top of it, and hopefully we could get something done at the national level, which would be great. Because this has been a problem in other states and municipalities that have done it. Uh, because it is attractive to, to get that natural gas. It's a resource that can be helpful. Obviously, it brings revenue. Um, so I understand the appeal, but it's too dangerous, in my view. Well, New York City's water supply is, is, is a jewel. Yes, it's we, the envy. We're spending billions on a third water tunnel to try to keep it stable. It's what makes our bagel so delicious. Oh. <laughs> I have a note about recycling. You, you had some legislation in the city council I did. I got the mayor to start a public recycling program in the city, and originally I suggested 30 locations to him, and you may have seen the bins pop up in different places. It's been very successful, and the mayor has expanded it. I think there are around 50 spots now. I noticed one on Spring Street that popped up just practically overnight. But it's a, play, it's a way for people to recycle their paper, their metal, uh, their plastic while they're out and about. So if you have lunch in Bryant Park, or you read the paper at Union Square and you want to be able to recycle that, you can, which is great. It's been a big success. In the environmental area, the Marine Transfer Station off East 91st Street, we obviously need to find a way to get rid of our garbage, but the community has been frightened to death at the thought of long lines of garbage trucks idling along York Avenue, about air pollution that would affect the asphalt green recreational area and the parks around it. Uh, is that just going to happen? Is there still I a hope not. To, We're uh, still fighting. I mean, it's a terrible plan. It's a very misguided plan to put this garbage station right in the heart of asphalt green, which sees 675,000 visits a year. That's taught tens of thousands of kids to swim for free. Uh, it makes no sense. And we tried to defeat it in the council. I voted against it. Unfortunately, it passed over my objection. We have two lawsuits that are pending in the courts. Uh, one uh, I'm more hopeful about and has been before a judge for quite some time. Uh, Assemblymember Kellner has legislation in Albany that would also effectively ban this facility. We have been able to keep the federal government from issuing permits up until now. And I think every day we delay is a better day for us and for the community. The project has gone up in cost, which in a tough economic time uh, may make it less likely to build. It's also been pushed back. So there are no shovels in the ground. That's a victory. I think every day that we can keep fighting uh, is, a, is a good day for us. And I, I haven't given up, and I don't think the community should either. Well, we're on the subject of, related subject of parks. Um, community Board 8, through its, its uh, 197A subcommittee developed the south end of the FDR Drive Park by the heliport uh, site at 61st Street. And there's been talk of having Ruth Messenger pioneer the idea of having a walk mm -hmm. around Manhattan. Um, the temporary roadway that was built around Sutton Place for the FDR Drive reconstruction, uh, some have proposed, you have proposed, making that into an extension of the green belt, the greenway. What's the chance of that happening? Oh, I hope it's good. I, I think it would be a wonderful thing for us to do. I would love for us to have on the east side something similar to what they have on the west side, where you could really walk the whole length of the East River or bike or rollerblade or, or what have you. So the pylons that were used for the roadway are still in the water. The state wants to take them out but we're trying to keep them in as long as we can, and we have at least for now up until next spring to keep them in. You know, like anything else, it's a cost issue. Uh, building this would cost a lot of money. So there are different proposals out there uh, that would fund this. One involves uh, using the Robert Moses Playground as a development site for the UN and being able to sell that parcel of land 
we would have to replace that parkland somewhere else and the community is working with the city on coming up with alternatives and po possible options for that because we have too, you know, too little parkland to lose anything. Mm -hmm. But that is a, an example of one way we could raise some revenue to put in a, a walkway along that temporary FDR drive. That west side uh, bikeway, walkway, green belt is wonderful. It's fabulous. It's great. So I grew up on the west side where it ended at 72nd Street and that was it. And then it was uh, uh, railroad tracks. And if you go on a sunny weekend day, and you just see thousands of people out enjoying it. It's a really wonderful thing. Construction safety was something that uh, was a great concern last year. Some new legislation was, was put in place as a result of your work. Um, are we better off now? I think we are. You know, we suffered two terrible tragedies, and I do think we're better off now. I, I passed four bills that deal specifically with cranes, and I think go a long way towards making construction safer. Um, but that said, this is an issue that I want to continue to work on. In fact, uh, there's a New York Times story that just came out today uh, that quotes me. The buildings department is looking to outsource their licensing programs for some of these construction licenses, um, which I think is very dangerous. We don't have a great track record on mm -hmm. doing that. And they haven't presented to me the rationale. It's going to cost us more money and I'm not sure it's going to make us safer. So until they show me how they would be able to um, privatize this piece and make us safer, you know, I, I don't think it's a good idea. So it's an issue that I think is ongoing. Uh, I do think my legislation made crane operations safer, but this is a city that is dynamic. There's building going on all the time. I know we're in an economic downturn now, but that's going to change. And I think we have an opportunity now, because times are a little slower, uh, to put new and tougher mechanisms in place, not go in the other direction. Before we run out of time, uh, I want to get onto women's issues because you've taken a real strong leadership role both in in, uh, uh, in the area of uh, women's rights, reproductive rights, and women's safety issues, which have come to the fore. Men don't. It's it's. Men have no clue as to what it's like to be a woman in a crowded subway, only when we're told. Um, but this is real. This is a, a level of harassment that's, that's horrible and unacceptable. Well, we had a hearing today on a, a, well, not on the bill that I had put in, but on the subject of sexual harassment and assault in the subways. It is a problem. I think you'd be hard-pressed to find a woman who commutes during rush hour who doesn't have at least one story of a time that they have been fondled or inappropriately approached. And it's against the law. So we'd like to, I would like to find a way to get the police to document those crimes. People do report them and they go after these folks. So it's important to report these crimes. But to see where it's happening, is there a way to target, do better enforcement? They testified today, for example, the bulk of these crimes happen in Manhattan, which is not a huge surprise. Morning and PM rushes, not a huge surprise. If we could drill down a little bit more and find out what stations, what subway lines, then we would be able to better deploy our resources and to tackle that and to make women uh, safer in the subway system. So that's something I care about. You and I have talked a little bit as well about the health care reform debate going on in Washington. Mm -hmm. We are on the verge of making real history in this country. The question is what kind of history do we want to make? And the Stupak Amendment that was added to the House version of the bill uh, really is the biggest assault on women's rights, reproductive rights, and health care in a generation. And it's very important for women and men to speak out about this because it, it would effectively ban uh, all insurance companies from offering coverage for abortions. So if you were poor or middle income, you wouldn't be able to afford an abortion. And even if you were buying your own insurance privately, this amendment would have... Couldn't buy it. You wouldn't be... Because the insurance that you would buy would probably be participating in an exchange where they would be getting a subsidy for another customer. And if they're getting one dollar of subsidy for one customer, then it would impact you. So uh, that's something that is... A, it's, it's, it has to be taken out of the final version of health care reform. You had a press conference with uh, Senator Gillibrand on we this. We did. Uh, we had a press conference earlier this week. Congresswoman Maloney was there, the head of NARAL, the head of Planned Parenthood. I mean, it, it is a real, I would ho like to think 
that people didn't realize what they were voting on when it was added, uh, but it is a real assault on women's rights. Our viewers should know that um, this show is pre-recorded, so when we make reference to today or this week, um, we're actually going to be broadcasting on um, Thanksgiving night. So uh, happy Thanksgiving to, to our viewers. We have a, a lot to be grateful for. Uh, when our community uh, precinct council has as its number one concern bicycle safety, that says our crime rate is down. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got good elected officials. We have a, a terrific police department. Um, you very often attend the, the precinct council meetings. Yourself. I try. I try to go to as many community meetings as I can. It's hard, but I try. I think it's important to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and to hear what their concerns are, hear their ideas. And as I start my new term, I certainly want to encourage the viewers today to give me a ring, send me an email, follow me on Facebook. Uh, JessicaLappin.com is my website because it's very important to me to have that feedback and interaction from the people that I represent. And I feel very honored to have this opportunity to be serving in the city council. I went to jessicalappin.com to look through what you listed as your priorities, and they're consistent with the priorities that, uh, um, that the community board has been, been dealing with. Um, again, our community board website, www.cb8m.com, is an excellent resource. Uh, if you're interested in applying to be appointed to, um, to serve on a community board, you can get an application from our website or from the borough president's office. I want to thank you for, for joining us. Thank Someone you for happy. having me. It was a pleasure. Good night and happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving.